there has been a a lot of attention, especially over the last 20, 25 years, um, on a, a sort of a, a separate area of Buddhist contemplative studies. Um, its growth and popularity uh, are quite understandable because of the way in which some of the early developments in things like mindfulness, education, um, uh, meditation, and so on, uh, go all the way back to the 70s, brought in certain dimensions of Buddhist practice. It's also perfectly understandable uh, because of the, uh, the role and the uh, popularity of the Dalai Lama and the significant interest that certain uh, cognitive uh, neuroscientists and psychologists have, uh, have um, brought to bear on those techniques. We also have a somewhat um, sort of lack of connection between the uh, development in meditation studies as Buddhist meditation and on yoga. So characteristically, when we have meetings which are brought together, uh, even in, uh, say, something like the Mind Life Institute's conferences, the focus in yoga studies tends to be in more on, for example, things about um, blood pressure and, and, and you know, sort of the heart and about uh, various kinds of um, responses to autoimmune problems like rheumatoid arthritis and so forth. And I think there has been willing uh, on, on different sides to try and treat all of this as part of a larger contemplative science tradition. Um, in fact, only I think a few weeks ago, I was uh, giving a plenary at the Contemplative Research uh, Conference hosted by Mind Life Institute, where there, were, there was a real rich interaction. But what we don't at the moment have is an encyclopedic volume which brings together such a uh, sort of together these different dimensions, not only in the context of the Indic traditions, but uh, across uh, Asian uh, practice traditions, contemplative traditions as a whole. There's also, of course, the uh, avowedly uh, multidisciplinary approach of the volume as a whole. And I think that is really, really important. And obviously, some of us are going to be um, closer to some rather than others. A, a paper, say, on the, uh, the, the evolution of the Sanskrit concepts around yoga from the Vedas through into the uh, late pre-modern period is something that you know, I would have been aware of over the past 30, 35 years of studies. Something for on, on um, the relationship between cognitive science and um, uh, sort of contemplative sciences as a whole, as I've said, is an emerging interest that many of us have got into in the last, say, 10 years or 15 years. And then there are areas that I don't, I personally wouldn't know very much about, like the digital humanities, where um, the application of digital humanities techniques to uh, developing uh, complex, layered, uh, textual philological analysis, including uh, critical editions and diplomatic editions and, uh, and multiple variations, is something that immediately any scholar who knows texts would understand the significance of, but many of us would not really have thought about it in that way. And then there are areas which um, Suzanne and Karen talk about as our blind spots, the things that the very structuration of our discipline doesn't even let us think about, but which once um, uh, it's brought to our attention immediately um, sort of makes us face the significance of these areas. One such, for example, is the uh, important dimension of the gendered body when it comes to yoga in the West. The idea that a particular kind of white um, uh, sort of middle class, younger uh, woman becomes the ideal shape of the yoga practitioner and what kind of pressure that puts on uh, people with other kinds of uh, body structures and images, for example. Immediately, that is obvious. Anybody who knows, who's even aware of thinking about notions of uh, bodiliness and gender would see that. But we wouldn't automatically think of it uh, if, say, you are a Sanskrit, Sanskritist burrowing away at um, Patanjali, uh, you know, uh, philosophical ideas in Patanjali. So 
what I'm finding is that every, I was sort of skittering up and down the contents pages and clicking on uh, one paper after another, sort of almost like a, a child in a, in, a, in a sweet shop. There are things that I've always loved and I would always go to them, but the sheer novelty and originality and range uh, uh, was almost overwhelming. And I spent quite a good chunk of yesterday skipping around uh, reading different uh, papers just to have the sheer joy of the comprehensiveness of this, um, this book. And I think it, it really allows uh, us, for example, to think of classes on uh, contemplative studies more widely, meditation and yoga, which themata them thematically brings together uh, really often terrifically accessible and well-written uh, uh, papers, even for advanced undergraduates. But there's also, um, it's, this is the kind of book where when you meet people who have a, a very partial view of, uh, of, of the larger consequence, you, I, I'm thinking, for example, of people with a particularly political, cultural orientation these days in India to yoga. And while, of course, you want to support them on their commitment to that cultural tradition, you also want to challenge them about perhaps uh, their more exclusivist uh, readings and, and their uh, reworking of uh, a fear of appropriation into a particular kind of cultural nationalism. And whether you get through to them or not, it's possible to have a book that you can present and say, look, take a little bit of time before you understand the larger context within which the practices that you're proud of are in fact embedded. Equally, we could turn around and have people in health sciences, for example, and I'm sure those of you here who have that experience will immediately think, yes, it would be so useful to uh, give something uh, really grounded, something wide ranging, something detailed to people who are only now beginning to understand, well, there are issues about workplace stress and so forth in, in the NHS, and we're just starting to have meditation and yoga techniques involved, but what are we doing it for? How does it happen? What's, how are we to not uh, commit cultural appropriation? How are we not to burden um, you know, uh, uh, patients with cultural knowledge that might not be relevant, things that many of the speakers here, many of who are also writers, uh, contributors to this volume would really understand. So I think this is a multi-purpose volume and it's really important. And I'm very, very grateful to have, um, as a scholar myself, to be, I'm very grateful to have this volume uh, coming out at this uh, time. So I, I'm just going to begin by introducing you to Suzanne Newcomb and um, Karen O'Brien, O'Cop, who are the, uh, the two editors. Suzanne is a senior lecturer in religious studies at the Open University and the honorary director of um, Inform, which is an independent charitable organization that researches and provides information about minority religions. And uh, Karen is a lecturer in Asian religions and ethics at the University of uh, Roehampton. What I'll do now is hand, them, uh, hand over proceedings to the two of them and that they can introduce you to the particular speakers. And once uh, we've had uh, the speakers give uh, uh, brief summaries of their ideas, I'll come back with a few responses and then we can throw it open to the audience for questions, which I'm sure you've already been um, told uh, will have to be put into this thing called Slido. And I'll try and handle as many as I can in the time we have. Okay, over to Suzanne and Karen. Thank you to the Centre of Yoga Studies for hosting this book launch and to Professor Chakravarti Ram Prasad for introducing the text and for giving us your critical perspective. As a co-editor, it has of course been an honour to work with the many scholars who have contributed to this research handbook over the last three years. Spanning 34 chapters, the volume is intended to bring the reader up to date on research in yoga and meditation by highlighting as uh, Professor Ch Ram Prasad uh, outlined, recent newly published and emerging research studies and perspectives. What is also unique about the volume is the wide range of disciplinary approaches to meditation and yoga. So as you've been hearing, you can get up to date on history of religion, critical theory, theology, cognitive science, sociology, digital philology, sound studies, economics, art history, and many other approaches in this single volume. 
The research handbook aims to be comprehensive. In particular, we wanted to provide a one-stop shop for graduate students, researchers and educators who are trying to get a sense of the emerging directions of study. But of course, it cannot be a complete guide to current research. And there are many interesting and important new projects, articles and books underway or soon to be published that will add to this picture and eventually transform it. Across the volume, you will see that scholars have grappled with central questions, themes and tensions inherent in studying yoga and meditation in the contemporary world, in historical cultures, and from the often Euro and America centric academic traditions. By investigating the meanings and assumptions behind practices associated with yoga and meditation in a range of contexts, in specific historical periods and regions, and through these many different lenses, the hope is that this volume can contribute to a breaking up of siloed knowledge and rigid, rigid conceptual frameworks. So we are fortunate to have the panel of scholars that we do tonight, but we also want to acknowledge the many other authors who cannot be on the panel tonight, um, but some of whom we may be able to hear from in the discussion period afterwards. And thank you very much, Karen. And it's been a, a very great pleasure to be introduced so um, sympathetically and understandably by um, Professor Ron Passad. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with Karen, and I'm really grateful to be hosted by the Center of Yoga Studies again today. Um, and one of the most um, pleasurable and exciting things about putting this book together for me was the workshop we had where we tried to get almost all the authors together at SOAS to have interdisciplinary discussions about the content of their chapters and um, how their perspectives might be read by people who have no prior knowledge of their discipline or their particular historical context. So. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got a selection of those people who joined in the workshop. Some of them weren't able to be at that workshop, but we're really pleased to, to have them here today because for me, putting this book together, what made it so exciting was just how much activity there is in both yoga and meditation studies, how much um, possibility there is for dialogue and new ideas and insights. So I really hope that you find the ideas and discussions stimulating. And as much as we are trying to do a comprehensive handbook of the kind of the state of the field at the moment. Um, we are so aware of how, um, no matter how well we did at that, there's still areas that we couldn't cover and it's, it's impossible to do justice to everything. So we really want to see this handbook as a kind of um, start of a conversation, a jumping off ground. And we know it's not the last word on any of the subjects that are covered, um, but we never intended it to be. So we framed it in five different sections just to kind of give you an overview the first one tries to to frame the the world of both meditation studies and yoga studies um which is was pointed out in the introduction have often been operating kind of not in conversation with each other particularly in published literature even if a lot of individual scholars might talk to other scholars and realize the overlaps and, and personality and um, the overlaps and kind of uh, there's often great personal and historical and traditional overlaps but these are often just discussed on a personal level they're not really reflected in the academic literature yet so we really want to try to encourage a change in that because I think that yoga can't be really understood without understanding it's it, the context of meditation and, and likewise meditation is also very much the same as yoga and sometimes they're used as synonyms um, although each tradition has different ways of understanding that so it's not like you can say yoga here is the same as here but they're they're families and we need to look at the whole family if we want to know what's going on and how it's changed and evolved through time so the second um section is um, the history of yoga and meditation in South Asia. And one of the interesting things about this book is that um, we don't actually, we, we try to encompass doctrinal, doctrinal perspectives and positions in section three. We've got a really um, interesting mix of say how yoga and meditation were understood in Islam and Christianity and Taoism and as well as Jainism and we don't have Hinduism in section three because Hinduism um, is almost the entire section of 
um, part two, and it actually pervades the entire book. And we found that um, there was no way to do justice to the breadth and expanse of the, the Hindu traditions of India in any one chapter. So that, that was something interesting. That wasn't what we planned when we first like, mapped out who we wanted to write each chapter individually or what, what we wanted covered. But it was really fascinating to try to, um, like, like yoga, like meditation, Hinduism um, pervades every chapter of the book. And you'll, you'll get a different understanding in each chapter, which I think is really exciting. Um, chapter four, uh, sorry, section four is about the global and regional transmissions. And again, we're really blessed to have some regions explored for the first time in English. The amount of yoga and meditation studies in Korea, for example, has been... Um, quite impressive, but we've not been until very recently in dialogue with those scholars. Um, we are able to offer one of the first English presentations of the yoga traditions in Latin America, and we've got um, Adrian Munoz here to talk about that. We've also got a section on um, yoga in meditation studies in Japan. Um, so there's all sorts of regions we we're able to highlight in the differences, but there are also a lot that we didn't get in. We'd love to have had um, a more of an exploration on Chinese traditions in a broader sense. We'd love to have had something about post-Soviet, um, post-communist states and the different way yoga and meditation has been interpreted there. We would have loved to have something from Africa and the different ways that, um, the, the, the vast different ways that yoga and meditation traditions have been um, put onto that continent, which is really understudied and, and comes from both immigrants for hundreds of years, as well as more recent modern yoga. So there's lots of really complex stories out there for future resources to really get their hands on. And that's, that's really exciting. Um, and then our final section is on disciplinary framings. And again, this isn't comprehensive, but we really wanted to get a sense of the many different ways you can approach understanding yoga and meditation and how what you're looking at shifts depending on how you're looking at it. And this, this really becomes um, the case when you're looking at something like um, sound and yoga. And we, I'm really excited to have Finney in here to talk about his chapter because I, I found it personally really interesting to think about soundscapes as I'd never thought of them before. And that kind of made me think about yoga and meditation traditions in a, in a new way for myself personally, who tends to be very textual oriented. So I will um, thank everyone once again. Stop nattering on so much. And I will introduce our first contributor, who is um, Brian Larios, who's contributed a chapter on scholar practitioners of yoga in the Western Academy, which is a very important contribution because we often don't talk about um, th to what extent we have personal involvements in the subjects we're studying in yoga and meditation studies. But um, Borian's a very interesting scholar more widely. He's an assistant professor at the Department of South Asian, Tibetan and Buddhist Studies at the University of Vienna, um, where I've been very happy to have visited as part of the ARIO project, which has also supported the production of this book. So I'd like to thank them formally. Um, and he's also um, looked at Vedic schools in Maharashtra and street shrines. He knows a lot about food practices. Um, he takes great photography. Um, so. I'll, I will hand over to Borian. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for that very kind introduction. And I would like to thank the SOAS Center for Yoga Studies, Theo, and of course, Karen and Professor Chakrabarti also for this book lounge. It's the first book lounge that I've ever taken part of as an author. And uh, it's the first Zoom book lounge that I participate in. So I'm, <laughs> I'm quite looking forward to this great conversation with uh, uh, so many interesting people. And um, first of all, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for introducing me as the author of this chapter. But I must say uh, I'm the co-author of this chapter as well with Mark Singleton, who is not here with us today. But um, of course, uh, we co-wrote this um, chapter together. So. Uh, whatever I say today is on me, but uh, the content uh, and the chapter is, of course, the responsibility of both of us. Um, so let me tell you about what our chapter is about. 
the chapter takes as its focus the scholar practitioners of yoga in the Western Academy. That is to say, scholars who research, teach, or, or write about yoga in accredited modern universities or research institutes. And at the same time, also practice and or teach yoga as a practice uh, in their daily lives. So uh, it is in one sense uh, a work of uh, ethnographic observation, if you will, or in our case also auto-ethnography, um, because both Mark and I have uh, taught and practiced uh, yoga in some form or the other. Um, but it also tries to flesh out the various contexts or environments uh, in which yoga is taught and researched as an academic discipline. And so the, quick question, the key question for us is how participant on or insider status is negotiated within academia. In other words, how scholars who take yoga as a subject of their academic work situate themselves with regard to practice. And conversely, also to examine the degree to which their practice of yoga informs their scholarly work or not. And so partly as a heuristic ex exercise for, for this chapter, we conducted a small survey uh, among the contributors of this handbook. And so we sent um, uh, a few questions regarding their relationship as scholars to the practice of yoga. And so we sent uh, the following in four questions as part of the survey. One, do you practice yoga or meditation regularly and or have practiced yoga meditation regularly in the past? And if yes, what kinds? Second, have you ever taught practical uh, uh, yoga or meditation? And third, have you ever taught um, yoga or meditation in non-academic settings? That is center, studios, uh, teacher trainings, and so on and so forth. And if so, what is the difference in your experience of teaching in academic and non-academic settings? And the fourth and last question was, do you experience any tension between your academic life and your life as a practitioner of yoga or meditation and do you consciously keep this separate in any way? And we received a total of 18 answers out of uh, 34 scholars to whom we sent our questionnaire. Uh, and while this preliminary survey is certainly not uh, in any way intended to be representative in any way of the international community of yoga scholars as a whole, it does offer us a, a somewhat uh, representative cross-section of scholars of yoga and meditation. And as we've heard also from, from the presentation of Professor Chakrabarti, but also from Suzanne, it is quite amazing what uh, the array uh, of explorations that we, can, th that we can have around yoga as an uh, uh, academic discipline. Uh, of course, that variety is also expanded into the different forms of practice right, uh, and uh, uh, of what even constitutes yoga and meditation. Um, so all the, res all the respondents, uh, but two uh, in, our, in our survey, practice or have practiced some form of yoga or meditation regularly as part of their daily routines, personal daily routines. Um, the survey was also revealing of how the uh, diversity of academic cultures and discipline, disciplines influences a scholar's professional stance regarding the comp compatibility of yoga as a practice within academia, with some respondents reporting considerable tensions between their lives as practitioners and their lives as scholars, while others reported a seamless non-differentiated position where practice and research effectively, effectively felt to be the same endeavor. So in our chapter, we try to uh, conceptualize different types of scholar practitioners. And these are, of course, ideal types. Um, and that uh, led us to um, first also uh, consider the different uh, academic cultures that we find across the globe. Um, for instance, uh, contrasting the German 
um, 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 philological tradition would say uh, the American context uh, of uh, uh, theology. And thus we can have very different understandings of A, what yoga research entails, but also what yoga practice entails. And so that, that sort of complicates uh, the picture considerably. Um, so however, these, these ideal types that we came up with um, are uh, basically, uh, uh, we could, we could uh, separate them into two main categories, uh, and that will be those who work in a formal university setting and those who teach in non-university settings uh, to start with. And with that, uh, of course, a whole array of, of uh, uh, possibilities um, that, that uh, arise from that. So some scholar practitioners uh, practice yoga and do so uh, openly and consciously, uh, uh, while others consciously hide it for uh, various reasons. Um, scholar practitioners uh, as a second category or a different category that uh, also are in academia, but advocate from an insider's perspective, um, the, the practice of, of yoga and also use it in, um, in their teaching as, as, a, as a tool. And so as you can see, there, there are many different ways in which um, this um, role or this status within um, academia is negotiated. Um, and this, this uh, chapter um, tries to explore that question and offer some preliminary answers uh, to that. Of course, this, this chapter uh, also indicates the many possibilities for, for further research in this area. Um, because as, as uh, Suzanne also mentioned, this is rather um, an understudied um, um, project or an understudied area, um, where, whereas the, the actual topic of the uh, insider-outsider perspective is, of course, an older one, particularly in anthropological research. So um, the phenomenon of the uh, contemporary yoga uh, uh, scholar practitioner is in some respects an outcome of a specific modern global history of yoga over the past two centuries in which yoga has been adopted and adapted in a variety of ways and is far uh, and far from its place of birth along with other eastern physical and metaphysical practices such as perhaps uh, tai chi or, or um, something else um, the scholar practitioner of yoga thus finds himself or herself in an intriguing, unique historical position, one of which knowledge of yoga comes not or not only from older customary forms of transmission from guru to disciple, but also from evidence-based evidence, uh, scholarship whose first commitment is to the advan advancement of knowledge in the professional scholarly community rather than to the cultural or religious traditions. And um, I'll stop there just um, to keep uh, uh, more time for questions and for the conversation uh, open. But I, I thank everyone for, for your attention. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much, Borian. Um, next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Balbinder Singh Borgal, who is professor in Sikh studies at Hofstra University in New York. And his chapter is titled Sikhi, Sikhism, Yoga and Meditation. And Professor Bogal's chapter discusses the often uh, somewhat underexposed but very specific meanings and practices of yoga and meditation in the Sikh religion in historical and contemporary terms. So over to you, Balbinder. Okay, thank you so much. Can, can you everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you to the organizers. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, Karen. And thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ram Prasad for that great introduction to the book. I haven't seen the book, so I'm, I'm also excited now to have a look at the diversity that's present there. Um, okay. Uh, I think the subtitle, hidden subtitle to my uh, chapter should be a critique. Um, I think uh, in the 15th century, the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scriptures, written in 1604, compiled and written then by the authors themselves, 
um, is it, as such is one of the first, if not the only uh, systematized critiques, Indic critiques, Indic and pre-colonial critiques of yoga by those that practice or, or at least in the field of yoga. So I think that the, the nature of that um, critique is uh, of a, a substantial nature and is quite um, uh, an important contribution to the area, I would argue. So um, because often Sikh studies is uh, not that well known given its newness, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give a little brief summary of the chapter key movements. Just one last point on that uh, critique uh, of yoga and meditation uh, by the, the Guru Granth Sahib. It, it foreshadows the early colonial critique in the 19th century in the 1890s by the British and was mimicked by Vivekananda, etc., with his Raja Yoga. So that's quite interesting. Four centuries before that critique, that colonial critique, that uh, uh, many Indi indigenous Indians uh, internalized was um, given in the Guru Granth Sahib from an Indic perspective. So I think that that's something unique there. Okay, uh, the chapter uh, locates the Sikh tradition within two major shifts. Uh, one that I call the Renaissance, Indic Renaissance shift, and the other I call the Sikh Enlightenment shift. So briefly, the Renaissance shift is that many traditions realize that the power of um, spirituality or the truth or what yoga leads to isn't only to be located within the ascetic realm of the yogi or the jogi in, in Punjabi. And that, um, that power can also be accessed in the householder realm. So this merger between the forest and society, um, the yogi and the bogi or the grihast, that merger I'm calling the renaissance because many, many uh, traditions engage in that shift, led by bhakti, etc. And um, the Sikh tradition also does that. So it has combined terms like jogi, bogi, to show that uh, you can be a yogi within society, within the householder. Okay, so that's, that's the renaissance shift. And I'm calling that arsen. The Sikh tradition has a, a, the term asan, asana, a seat. The seat of that authority is subjective mastery, the mastery of one's inner self, one's inner culture. Um, then the second shift, which I don't see many traditions make, I, I please enlighten me, those that know more, um, but I think Sikhs are perhaps one of the few traditions that make the second shift, that's why I'm calling it the Sikh enlightenment, to mimic the idea of uh, European enlightenment. And here what we see is that not only is the yogi and the bogi brought together, the ascetic and the household are brought together, but that yogi bogi is brought together within the state, within governance, within uh, rulership and justice. So the idea of Raj. Now the six combine again, which I would call a middle way, the Sikh tradition is the middle way, the Jogi Bogi with Raj, uh, um, Raj Yoga, not Vivekananda's Raj Yoga, which is a hop back to Upanishadic meditational bias. But this is the Raj Yoga that enters power society through the Sangat, through the, the Sikh community, the Khalsa that builds up and eventually culminates with the rulership of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh in um, 1799 to 1849, just before the British come and uh, annex the Punjab. So those two shifts um, enact um, the uniqueness of the Sikh tradition and the vantage from which they uh, mount their critique against yoga, which mostly would be seen as apolitical and self-serving, just for oneself, not as part of a community. Um, Okay, so the Sikh critique of yoga, simply put, is a, a critique against techniques based on how the ego employs techniques. So it's a critique against the ego. The whole Guru Granth Sahib is um, a, a challenge to that. 
and therefore it shifts not from it shifts from techniques to a practice of the way okay so then um, that's a very quick summary of that part of the chapter then I go into uh, the transition into modernity where there's a break the shift from uh, Raj Yoga as it enters modernity is that the kingdom is taken over the British through two Anglo-Sikh wars rule uh, northwest um, India the Punjab and they demilitarize the Sikhs so the Raj part of the uh, tradition is um, uh, lost so then we only we have a split in modernity between um, Raj and yoga and we only have yoga left now that tradition of yoga or jog splits again during the modern period and what we get is what I call the Zen mind traditions all those that are under the Zen mind and then the yoga body traditions meditational ones and those that emphasize posture and that was uh, alluded to a little earlier with the uh, interesting shift between the Buddhist meditation and, and the yoga um, that uh, Professor Ram Prasad was talking about so here the Sikh traditions are demilitarized, the Raj is taken away and they're having to deal with a modern understanding of themselves. And in that modern understanding, given the presence of the British, the partition of India, the birth of two nations, uh, print technologies, cartography, sensors, railways, posts, office, telegraph, uh, canals, wholesale transformation of society led to reform movements. Those reform movements um, led to a shift economically and epistemically and those shifts had powerful forces of commodification consumption what i call techniqueization orientalism and uh, individualism so the huge change comes with colonial modernity and that colonial modernity only allows um, a jog the yoga side to develop so it's under the behest of a capitalist market. So you have selling spirituality as being okay because it's not political. It doesn't raise a voice against uh, the ruling order. Um, probably that's my time. If I just end with a couple of sentences of the chapter, is that okay? Okay, so I say, if the, the whole tradition in terms of uprooting the, uh, the ego is via the name, Nam, or the word, Guru Shabbat, the Guru's word. And those, the word, name, and the Guru are not particular things, they're universals. If the Guru, word, and name are not particular experiences, but the ground of experience itself, then any experience may trigger that connection. The unavoidable arbitrariness this presents is persistently missed by such groups and, and their misinterpretations, those modern uh, Sikh movements. This is why the gurus switch from the prescription of techniques to the praxis of the way. The inherent deconstructive and existential nature of the name as the nameless the word as an unsystematizable and the guru as everywhere but hidden will not allow such a reduction to technique that modernity's individualism demands. Last sentence. This constant deconstructive critique at the heart of the Guru Granth Sahib, one that refuses to be tamed into any kind of salve or technique, is the very antithesis of modern consumerism hungry for the next best technique or system. I'll end it there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker, so moving on, so we have time for questions, is um, Professor Satbir Singh Khalsa, who's been um, researching nearly full time on the clinical eff efficacy of yoga for probably 20 years now. And he's one of the most prolific, um, not only um, people with publication outputs in this field, but also in networking and collating and bringing all this um, information together. His, um, his CV is quite lengthy, um, but among his many um, affiliations, he's um, the 
research associate at the Benson Henry Institute for the Mind Body Medicine, research affiliate of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in the Department of, and also in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd encourage you to read his um, biography for, for a fuller um, understanding of everything he's been involved in. Um, I'd like to um, hear from Satbir. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne, for that introduction. So uh, the chapter that we wrote was on the psychophysiology of yoga. And I say we because the uh, two other authors on that chapter were not able to attend. That was Laura Schmaltzel and Pamela Jeter, who are also um, yoga researchers. Um, I think the simplest way to convey what we put into the chapter was to use, um, really refer to the central figure in the chapter, which is a logic model, which really summarizes um, what we, you know, how we conceptualize the, the research and, and, and the understanding that we have from the scientific studies that have been done. So at the top box um, in this logic model, we're identifying yoga practices and defining them as not just the postures, but also the breathing techniques of relaxation and the meditation. And of course, this distinguishes yoga from uh, a lot of practice in the West, which is just postures only. So most of the research that's been done has been done on these four components. And of course, there's other components that, that, can, that can happen. Um, people can adopt a yoga lifestyle. There's shot kriyas, there's dietary, there's, there's uh, communities and so on. But for the most part, the research studies have been done on this sort of um, uh, multi-component aspect of yoga. Now, from all of these practices, even individually and combined, we can make changes on the physical body, physiologically, on the musculoskeletal system in a, in a box that I'm calling fitness. Um, so things like flexibility, physical strength, coordination, balance, respiratory function, all of these have been shown to improve um, and um, this leads to a self-efficacy psychologically through the mind-body connection. And the research in this area is, is, is quite extensive and it's very uh, objective. It's very strong. Things are measured in angles and degrees and, 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 and millimeters. So um, this is very strong. And we know for a fact that, that we can make these kinds of changes when people uh, adopt a, a, a yoga practice. <clears throat> Also through all of these components, we are in increasing what I'm referring to as self-regulation of internal state. The abilities of these practices to gain the skills to be able to control internal functioning, both physical and psychological. And the two most important really um, are stress regulation and emotion regulation, which over time and with continuous practice lead to these skill sets of resilience to stress and equanimity in the face of emotional challenges. And that leads to an overall psychological self-efficacy. Now it's, it's primarily through the meditative component of yoga practice that we increase what I'm calling mind-body awareness. Uh, and I uh, view this term as synchronous with the term mindfulness, which has become so popular uh, now internationally in modern society. But mind-body awareness is really um, achieved through, you know, the focus of attention. There's multiple ways to do that. In yoga, we primarily focus on uh, single-point focus meditation practices where the focus is on mantra or a candle, but mindfulness is also an important part of this practice. That leads to changes in the central nervous system, cognitive function, concentration, and ultimately over time uh, achieves a state we call metacognition the ability to self-regulate um, uh, thought processes, to come to the understanding that you are not your thoughts, that you have some ability of self-regulation over your thought processes, which means that you can change your reactivity to your thought processes. In fact, you can even change your thought processes. And of course, metacognition is really sort of an underlying principle that occurs in the central yogic scripture of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Now, what many people experience um, in practicing yoga, particularly the meditative component over a, typically a longer period of time, uh, is um, what I'm calling sort of a spirituality, if you will, pure spirituality. And this is coming, I believe, from these inductions of these unitive states during meditation, um, which leads to these experiences of transcendence, the flow state. And many people actually um, experience a, a life transformation. Um, and most typical of that is the phrase yoga changed my life, which is really suggesting a sort of a deeper uh, transformation that's taking place in, in, in individuals life meaning and purpose and actually reflected in people's life's goals. Uh, 
Um, so the research, as I said, and the fitness is really strong. These two boxes here, self-regulation and awareness, over the past 20 years have undergone an enormous amount of research uh, fueled by some very modern technologies such, such as uh, brain imaging, uh, molecular biological approaches, biochemical approaches. And we're really coming to a strong understanding of how the central nervous system is impacted by yoga practices and how that influences psycholo psychophysiological function. And really the weak sister here is, is spirituality. Uh, it's difficult to get funding uh, to study this state, but it is possible to study uh, these kinds of transitions in spirituality. So one thing we're seeing, of course, is that we're, ch we're making changes uh, psychophysiologically on a broad spectrum, all the way from the gross level of connective tissue and, uh, and muscle uh, to the deepest experiences that humans can have. Um, and so this is uh, leading to essentially, in many studies, uh, an observation of changes in global human functionality, uh, improvements on the gross level, physical and mental health and performance, to the deeper skills that come over time of stress and emotion regulation, improvements in awareness and mindfulness, and then finally into metacognition. And that, uh, again, over time, typically more along the lines of months and years of practice of what we might call a yoga lifestyle, uh, people start to see shifts in, in deeper experiences like positive behaviors, well-being, uh, values, life purpose and meaning, and what we can refer to as sort of pure spirituality. So this is really summarizing where we are. And out of this logic model, you can immediately extrapolate the, the practical benefit of these types of practices in different life circumstances. So if we're talking about the medical system, um, as we've done in our, in our medical textbook, The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare, a lot of these factors are risk factors for disease, particularly non-communicable diseases. Uh, and so improvements in the physical level, improvements in stress regulation, uh, improvements in mind, mindfulness can change behavior. Uh, this has enormous relevance for, for many medical conditions. If you're considering um, schools, my laboratory has been involved in studies of yoga in the public school settings. Again, you're looking at improvements in concentration, cognition for grades and, and academic performance, but there's a huge burden of stress uh, in our youth population. So there's, there's relevance there for that. And then finally, we've also been conducting studies on yoga in workplace settings. And again, uh, many of these things are all uh, relevant to that. Uh, there's a big issue in burnout right now, and that's, that's really relevant to the stress regulation component. So this really sort of summarizes um, you know, where we are at and where the, where the knowledge is, is really coming forward. Uh, and it's a very bright future because this area of research is exploding very, very rapidly. And it's a very exciting time to be uh, to be in this field. So with that, I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, let the next speaker move on. Fantastic, thank you very much. And um, before we move on to our next speaker, I, I'd like to just um, thank all the contributors who are in the audience who we weren't able to have speak today, but it's really great to see so many of you here and if any of you have questions about any of the other chapters or subjects that we weren't able to highlight today, um, just throw them in the Slido bar, um, or if you'd like to ask any other questions, um, the details should have been in your invitation. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Adrian Munoz, who's lecturer of South Asian religions at the College of Mexico in Mexico City. And he specializes in um, yoga literature, hagiography, and history. And his contribution is a really exciting um, first foray into putting yoga and meditation studies in Latin America on the map as being both distinct and having overlaps with how these practices have been understood, practiced, interpreted in the rest of the world. So Adrian. Hi, uh, well, first of all, thanks to the Center of Yoga Studies for organizing this book launch and especially to both Suzanne and Karen for inviting me to take part into this exciting project. This is a very, very stimulating project and I'm, I'm really looking forward to all the conversations that are to follow. Um, well, my, my chapter is part of a wide project that seeks to unravel the historical developments of yogic trends in Latin America. For this purpose, yoga is here understood not only as asana-based techniques, but as the various trends of self-discipline, meditation, and ethics that can be comprised by the term. 
The starting point is that yoga exemplifies a successful case of transnational flow of ideas about spirituality and well-being that transcends linguistic frontiers and is itself subjected to cultural translation, in particular regional and cultural worlds. The forms of yoga and meditation that we encounter in Latin America nowadays are the product of a very rich combination of factors. Evidently, it has been impossible to, sur to surmise them all in my chapter, but suffice it to say that a, there is a complex blend of aspirations, ideals, idealizations, projections, misrepresentations, and adaptations. Maybe there are three main things to consider. First, many Latin American expressions of yoga and meditation are largely, yet not exclusively, an inheritance of the developments in North America and Europe. As a result of this influence, many prominent varieties of these systems greatly emphasize the refinement of bodily postures. Secondly, there are a great number of centers and styles that prescribe meditation and ethical behavior above other aspects. And finally, there are some schools that foreground devotion. The European and North American influence has not ruled out regional innovations, such as syncretic forms of yoga, meditation, and pre-Hispanic purificatory rituals in places such as Mexico, uh, Brazil, Peru, Especially important is to account for the role of New Age. It has been an undeniable agent in spreading meditational and yogic ideas in the region. This has been far more than just an inheritance from the Anglophone world after the second half of the 20th century. On the contrary, a great number of theosophists, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, spiritualists, and the like have come to countries like Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Cuba, and Mexico since the 19th century with a view to implement the realization of a new age promise for the betterment of the human species in the new world. This was later reinforced by the contracultural movements in the 1960s and the 1970s. The new age sensibility has then allowed for a revelation of indigenous practices. Popular traditions and Latin American ethnicities have become special hybrid entities for the new age movements, while at the same time becoming a new promising environment for a global spirituality. The critical overview in my chapter offers a compact prospect of the history and modern developments of yoga and meditation in the region. Studies on different regional adaptations can disclose noteworthy variations in the reception histories of yoga. Thus, this project traces various instances of transference and inception of yogic ideas and scrutinizes the nature of adaptation and practice of yoga in non-Anglophone scenarios. Thus, for example, in Mexico, the early understandings of yoga were a combination of both socio-political discourses worldwide and a nationalistic enterprise of building a modern nation, where notions of race, identity, and cleanliness were paramount. Indeed, there is a wide scope for future investigation into the Latin American avatars of yoga. For example, do they reinforce, negate, or complement other stories of yoga in the modern world? And also, how are issues of yoga, India, national culture, and progress intertwined in different Hispanic countries? So, 
my contribution to the Rutledge Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies is a first preliminary step into this line of inquiry. My wish is not only to shed light into these regional developments, but to foster a dialogue with other localized histories of the reception of yoga. So I'll be glad to hear any comments or suggestions or whatever you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. And I'd like to introduce our last speaker tonight. Uh, it gives, great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Finian Geraghty, who is visiting assistant professor of religious studies and affiliated faculty member of contemplative studies at the Center for Contemporary South Asia at Brown University. His research interests include sound, mantra, and ritual in Indian religions, and he's working on a forthcoming book, The Whole World is Om, A History of the Sacred Syllable in India, which uh, will be the first ever monograph on this uh, research topic. Over to you, Finn. Thanks so much, Karen, for that introduction. And yeah, I just wanted to reiterate my um, congratulations, appreciation, uh, and thanks to the editors, Karen and Suzanne, for making this ongoing conversation possible. And it's been a very rich conversation. I wish, I wish that every edited volume afforded this kind of sustained engagement among its authors, right? I think the, uh, that would be, it's, that's just been such a boon. Um, and so I would also like to thank the Center of Yoga Studies uh, for you know, seeing this conversation and previous conversations. And I'm, I'm really gratified to uh, speak on behalf of the last section of the book on disciplinary framings. And broadly speaking, this, this section aims to bring yoga studies into conversation with other disciplines and bodies of theory. And so I'll just tick off the ones that are represented here. Uh, philology, digital humanities, ethnography, philosophy, art and museum studies, psychophysiology, cognitive science, identity formation, movement, and then my own contribution on sound. So as, as you can hear, it's, it's really quite a list. It's not, you know, it doesn't represent everything, obviously, but it's a, it's a first step, uh, I think, in a kind of maturation of this field and engaging uh, other kind of theoretical frameworks and kind of accounting for itself in a way. And so for my particular chapter on sound and yoga, uh, Karen and Suzanne invited me to bring yoga studies into engagement with sound studies. Uh, and so let me just start by posing the question, what is sound studies, right? Because it's a kind of a burgeoning uh, interdiscipline. Uh, and so I might uh, lean on the words of Jonathan Stern, who's one of the foremost uh, theorists of sound studies, who says that sound studies is an interdisciplinary approach to all things sound, exploring sonic practices, discourses, and institutions. And with that point of departure, I both begin and end my chapter on sound and yoga with a kind of twofold question. And the first part is, what is the significance of sound for understanding yoga? And then I flip that around and ask, well, okay, what's the significance uh, of yoga for understanding sound? And so let me begin with that, that first component, what sound studies uh, might offer in terms of insights. And I'll just tick off three key concepts that I found helpful. The first is auditory culture. And this is the basically describes the doctrines and practices and bodies of knowledge that are mediated by listening, right? This is culture you can hear. You could, if you need a, an analog, think of visual culture in uh, art history and so forth. The second is an idea of techniques of the body and, that, and specifically techniques of listening, right? So these are the ways that we humans go about listening and interacting with sound. And a kind of crucial uh, takeaway from sound studies and, and you know, theoretical um, claim is, is that the interplay of sound and listening is, 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 sim is absolutely central to this whole uh, discussion, right? So you have the stimulus of sound, but then you also have the perception of, of hearing and listening. And if we pull back for a second and think of this in terms of yoga, uh, I make the argument in the chapter that we should think of yoga as a technique of deep listening, right? And there's a lot to listen to, but uh, among the kind of most important 
foundations are listening to tradition, listening to the body, listening to the self, and listening to the absolute. And then the third concept that I wanted to emphasize is one that uh, Suzanne mentioned earlier, and that is the idea of the soundscape, right? And this, this has actually gotten a lot of traction in popular usage over the last decades, just to refer to kind of any acoustic environment, right? But in its critical usage, uh, a soundscape is a cultivated acoustic environment. And so what I mean by that is it's a domain of sound that has been curated and intentionally created. And when you think about it, uh, practices of yoga and all their diversity often aim to cultivate and interpret soundscapes, right? To attune the practitioner to chanted sounds like mantras, to inward sounds, to subtle sounds. And as I was writing the chapter from that perspective, thinking about what sound studies has to offer to yoga studies, I also kind of confronted some of the limits of this uh, critical discourse on sound, right? As I mentioned, it's a kind of a fairly new uh, discipline. And anyway, we're drawing on a kind of limited uh, lexicon of, in English to, of words to describe sound and listening, or maybe we haven't been attuned to kind of you know, find them and, and reach for them. And so it became clear that as I was writing the chapter that the second part of the question, that is to say, uh, what can yoga studies and the history of yoga teach sound studies might be even more interesting and more generative. And this is not least because it involved my main area of research, Indian traditions of mantra. So I kind of jumped at the chance to kind of bring some of my historical and ethnographic research uh, into conversation with these sound studies theorists who often focus on kind of Eurocentric uh, views of knowledge and culture. And I don't have to tell this group, it's probably obvious to most of you that Indian religions, which furnished the context for the earliest constructions of yoga, know quite a bit about sound and thinking sound. And so most of my chapter is devoted to taking stock of this rich engagement between yoga and sound over three millennia. I draw mostly on Sanskrit texts from the Veda to Patanjali to Tantric Mantra Shastra, but I also try to reach across a range of traditions, uh, Brahminical, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, and Sufi, and also to include uh, a diversity of regions and time periods, including uh, sonic practices in modern transnational yoga, like sound baths, for example. And along the way, I got a chance to kind of emphasize and grapple with key concepts in this rich history. I've already mentioned the category of mantra, also Brahman, the absolute in kind of uh, conceived in sonic terms, the sacred syllable Om, which is at the heart of my current research project, domains of subtle and gross sound, right? This, con this kind of contrast between sukshma and stula sound, uh, the idea of a, an unstruck sound, anahata, the transcendent name of the Lord like Ram, and that's just to name a few. And so with, with this brief summary in mind, let me just offer, uh, by way of conclusion, my own formulation on the relationship of sound and yoga, right? This is a way of, this is kind of my answer to that two-part question that I mentioned at the beginning. And forgive me uh, for quoting myself here. <laughs> uh, yoga is meditation through sound, understood as a technique of chanting that supports contemplative states, Meditation on sound as a technique of listening that leads to emancipatory absorption and meditation towards sound as the highest soteriological goal, identical with the self, the supreme deity, or the cosmic absolute. So thanks so much for your attention and I really can't wait to get this discussion going. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's been good to have everybody uh, cover what they needed to say, uh, although we are perhaps uh, 10 to 20 minutes beyond where uh, the editors and organizers might have wished. Um, we do have uh, maybe uh, three or four questions, which I'll, I'll try to uh, call out so that we have enough of a discussion. Uh, 
Uh, but I've been told that you know part of my um, role in this is to have a brief uh, response. So I'll try and keep it to about sort of two sentences each uh, for the things you've said. Uh, I'm particularly struck by uh, the, the things that uh, Baran and uh, Adrian said because they make us confront um, questions, I think particularly that, uh, that Baran mentioned, of modernity and its disruptions and recreations. To some extent, I think it's very interesting that we see the very idea of articulating the difference between certain kinds of uh, doxastic as well as um, existential commitments and the practices which arise out of it, that very distinction seems to be something that mod would have made no sense at all uh, until maybe 200 or 300 years ago and certainly not in the Indic traditions themselves. So um, looking at it that way might give us a very interesting way, I think uh, Brian touched on this, is um, about reconfiguring the etic emic distinction with, which has been beaten to death about the insider outsider study, because here it asks us what even we are doing in asking the question about the difference between how people practice in relation to what people believe, a distinction that would have made no sense for much of history. The uh, point I wanted to make about Andrian, on the other hand, is that there are some remarkable continuities. We might think that the geographic scale and range of yoga uh, really represents a certain kind of hermeneutic um, disruption. But on the other hand, perhaps it is just a globalization of the very pluralism that was built into uh, the classical Indian traditions from the beginning, so that the shock of how uh, Sri Vaishnavism in, in seventh, uh, 10th, 12th century South India, Tamil uh, country, might confront yoga practice, might perhaps not be so very different from how Roman Catholicism uh, grapples with it, either in India or indeed in Mexico. So I think there are times when things that we take for granted as obvious questions turn out to be historically contingent, and things that we think of as remarkably uh, new might turn out, in fact, to have conceptual continu continuities. I was really interested in what uh, Balbinda was saying, and I think it's absolutely true that the the, the uh, counter reading of yoga that happens in, fifth, uh, in the 15th, 16th century uh, in, the, in, in, in the Sikhi tradition really responds to the things that have been happening in the previous two, three, four hundred years. Um, oddly enough, however, both the question of the relationship between the householder and the renouncer in, 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 in relation to yoga practice and the connection between royal power and yogic practice are very much at the heart of, say, the Mahabharata. Th that's eminently where the place where these questions get raised. So it's an interesting uh, and perhaps provocative way to say that the novelty with which the Sikhi tradition confronted the uh, representation of yoga at the time in pre-modern India, in late pre-modern India, was in fact ironically a going back to deeper roots that had been lost in some of the practical traditions which situated themselves in relation to the Mahabharata, but had perhaps forgotten the conceptual roots within which, or the literary and narrative roots within which uh, yoga had been originally uh, situated. Um, I, I, t turning to uh, Finian, I, I really like the idea that we must enrich the study of sound through the study of the Indian materials amongst the wealth of um, disciplines where there is a poverty of understanding of non-material uh, resources. This is perhaps the largest one. One thing that I was really provoked into thinking about was how there are two types of relationships that sound has to uh, yogic practice. One is the creation of that uh, audio scape and its um, constitutive role in what yogic and meditative practice is supposed to uh, get consciousness to attain. But equally, it then flips around, and it, this goes back right to the time of the Buddha and his practices that we see in the Pali Canon. You also have an ability through the yogic practices to be able to handle any of the randomized uh, 
uh, audio scapes within which human beings exist, all the noise and all the chatter and so forth. And to some extent, nowhere than in the modern world and perhaps no more than in contemporary India, do we face the tension between creating the space and constituting that soundscape within which practice happens and the attainment of abilities through that practice by which those soundscapes, uh, which are not so conducive, are in fact uh, responded to, resisted, and perhaps reconfigured. I want to end with uh, Sadhguru Singh because I don't, uh, th th this is a fundamental uh, problem and question I had, and this is very much what I was uh, talking about uh, in, in this conference at Mind Life Institute that I mentioned before, which is I think that there is a great deal of um, learning to do through these kind of uh, cognitive and neuroscientific materials. But I think we should be deeply aware that there is a Cartesian dualism which informs contemporary scientific practices about uh, the brain and different bodily functions, which either says that there is a mind-body divide and we need to find a bridge between them or collapses them all into uh, physicalist reductionism. And we should be careful, of course, that that was simply not how these traditions saw themselves. Their organic ecological conception of the human being is often highly resistant and we should not try and um, as I said in, in, in that talk, you know, we shouldn't make it the case that uh, for somebody with a hammer, everything is a nail uh, because we have particular kinds of um, technological capacities in contemporary science. We should, I think, perhaps be very careful that therefore we do not reconfigure the notion of the human being in these meditative uh, traditions to fit the kinds of scientific technologies we have. So there are, there's a lot of space for um, a fruitful agreement, fruitful disagreement, uh, fruitful widening up of uh, the kinds of directions in which we can go. So and I'm very, very grateful for all of you to have introduced uh, uh, both to me and to all the audience, uh, some of the riches that lie in wait in this volume. So if the editors don't mind, should I kind of read out a, f uh, a question at a time and perhaps have a few minutes for people to answer and try and see how many we can get through? And obviously, if people can keep their answers as brief as possible, uh, we can get there. So one, uh, I presume it's to, to Borean. It starts with... Um, how can... Uh, what, is, what does decolonizing yoga mean? Does anybody want to go in on that? I think perhaps Borean, but anybody else? Well, I could say a few words, um, perhaps just to open, um, because we do have the first chapter after the introduction called Decolonizing Yoga, which is by Shamim Black. Yeah. And some of the time zones were a little bit less forgiving than others. So Shamim couldn't be here tonight to talk about her chapter. Yeah. Um, but the, the arguments that she lays out looks both at decolonization within the academy. So the idea that post-colonialism is very much about inclusion, about broadening the canon, about uh, bringing more furniture into the room and decolonization is a different conversation not just about what we're looking at in academia but how we're looking at it so it's very much about epistemology and the epistemic frame so decolonizing yoga would be bringing that recognition into the academic study of yoga by um, framing uh, knowledge production as not neutral but often from a euro-american academic frame um, and considering that within the history of colonialism, within the way in which disciplines like the study of religion have been formed very much as part of the colonial project and bringing all of that attention to bear on how we study yoga and meditation in the academy. And that will include the um, activist strategies of, for example, looking at reading lists, um, asking who we're reading, um, are our reading lists diverse? asking um, who's in the classroom, who has access to these courses, who's teaching, do we have all white faculties? Um, so it also brings, uh, it entails bringing in um, conversations from, for example, critical race studies, from um, studies of race and religion, and thinking about um, issues like whiteness in relation to yoga. So I think that's how I might frame some of the key issues in the academy. But of course, then there are different conversations about decolonizing yoga in terms of contemporary practice and what that might mean. And that's, I think, a related but different conversation. 
Thanks, thanks a lot, Karen. I'm now going to whiz through questions and uh, uh, mostly we know who the people are to whom these questions are being addressed. Uh, two sentences each, please, because we've probably got about 12 minutes. Um, uh, starting with Brian, um, should scholars open up about their dedication to yoga practice in their scholarship? And if so, to what degree and through which tools? All right, thank you for, for the question. Well, um, uh, I think you almost responded to that question uh, yourself, Professor uh, Chakrabarti. You know, what are we doing if, if we're uh, even asking the question of insider and outsider? And also um, what we try to show with this chapter is that there is no single way of a scholar positioning himself vis-a-vis um, uh, his role in the academia. So there are different possibilities of that. And I think all of them are um, valuable and, uh, and to be respected. And they have re very different reasons for that as well. Um, we also have to uh, uh, take into account the question of um, discipline, right? So it, it's, it is a difference, say, if you are a psychologist, a philologist, or an anthropologist doing research on what kind of yoga and what does yoga even mean in, in, in your research question. Um, but I think um, any kind of reflexivity uh, and transparency is, is uh, in my eyes, an, an asset. Um, to the reader, uh, as, as transparent as we can be as researchers uh, from, um, uh, you know, our own agendas. Uh, I think that will help also um, partly to, to address issues uh, like the ones that Karen mentioned uh, in regards to decolonizing uh, our gaze. So I think uh, the more transparent we are, the better. But uh, I do get why uh, some scholars prefer not to disclose you know, their practice or, or their engagement uh, with yoga. Thank you. Uh, Finian, do you see any hierarchy between, let's say, uh, the importance of sound instead of sight or touch in relation to the practice of yoga? Mm, interesting, yeah. Uh, from, you know, this, that's a difficult question because uh, in a way, the way I frame this is going to lead me to say, of course, sound is absolutely supreme <laughs> because uh, my selection of materials <laughs> has, uh, you know, been oriented in that direction, right? Uh, so I don't, but um, so from, in, in terms of the research I'm looking at and the materials I'm looking at, that's definitely the case. But of course, we would expect that to uh, completely be the case. I, I would, uh, I'll slightly maybe dodge the question by just saying that more research should be done both historically and uh, in the contemporary moments on the kind of aesthetics and kind of sensory modalities of yoga practice and then yoga traditions and doctrines so that we can get towards answering a question like that, right? Because uh, it's well known in sensory studies or it's, it's generally accepted that, you know, kind of in post enlightenment West, there's been this kind of hegemony of the eye and visual culture. And it would be quite interesting to contrast that with kind of other periodizations and hierarchies that we might find uh, in various yoga traditions. Well, actually, the thing is, because in classical India, the pramana system, the system of epistemology, does, in fact, for most of the philosophical systems, uh, place uh, sight above all others. So even yogic practice, in some sense, is a critique of the assumptions about the primacy of sight. So it's, it's worth uh, bringing that into, to, to bear on, as you say, uh, further studies. Uh, the question for Balbinder, you mentioned that the yogi in a colonial context was considered mainly apolit apolitical. How about today? Uh, yeah, apolitical, but I suppose it also matters on the context. It's being politicized, as you mentioned, also in India in terms of um, uh, 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 um, revived Hindu nationalism through certain figures uh, that uh, use that term of Raj Yoga and seeing a new form of uh, governance there. But uh, um, the key point about the politicization or depoliticization of yoga in the Sikh tradition is that the kind of yoga that was being developed there, um, Raj Yoga or Sahaj Yoga, which I didn't get time to really elaborate, um, that was depoliticized in the split into modernity. I think most of us don't realize that 
when we're entering into modernity, we're, we're being converted. Right. We're being converted into new epistemologies, new epistemological frames, as Karen was mentioning as well. And that those terms often, and those frames often get um, forgotten. If we just mentioned um, uh, pajamas or juggernaut or thug, you perhaps don't realize that those terms are Indic. And with the inscription of cl coloniality upon our body as our original, because we've forgotten, means that they were already predisposed to think in a certain parameters. And one of the key things that happens with the sick form of yoga is that it becomes depoliticized and we just enter the market. And we have our set of techniques and here's another set of techniques you can sell and buy and it cheapens the whole thing. Great. Uh, I think we just have enough uh, time for uh, of what's going to require a, a fairly comprehensive answer. This is a question to the editors. Are there any notable trends and patterns in the field of yogic studies that came up when compiling the book? And what are you excited to see next? Gosh, that's a big question. Yes, um, <laughs> I have all of, um, oh, I don't know, five minutes. Um, I'm going to try not to talk for too long. And um, actually, if any of the other contributors who haven't said anything, I'd like to give them a chance to respond if they have anything to say as well. So I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, for me, I think that the really exciting things are working more interdisciplinary understanding, but I think it's really about understanding the um, in practice, understanding the contingencies of our epistemological framework. So what's the most interesting thing about this, this like kind of trendy word decolonizing is actually what are the tools we're thinking with and are they the best tools for the job? And I think that one of the things that yoga studies as in its comparative context really throws up is, um, is a really great framework for, for those questions and thinking about what are we looking at? How are we looking at it? How does what we look at change with the way we're looking at? And how can we um, understand our, our place in the world as people differently through this practice of study and engagement? So that's my short answer, um, but I'd love to hear other people's answers. I don't know who else wants Philip, to come. Philip would like to say something. Can we unmute Philip? I oh, no, I just wanted to say briefly that as Suzanne and I were working on our chapter on Anglophone yoga, one of the things that, that came up is that there are a whole host of histories that are being worked on about the history of modern yoga in different parts of the world um, in various languages and starting to come out. So Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, France, uh, Austria, Germany, Mexico, South America. So I think in a few years, as these histories and this work comes to fruition, um, we're going to have a um, not only a, a much wider view of how modern yoga has come about um, through the 20th and 21st centuries, but I think we're going to start to see um, differences and trends of the different paths that modern yoga took um, say in Latin America or South America. Um, I think Suzanne's book does this with Britain and we're going to see more and more of this come out. And I think that's going to be very exciting. Uh, yeah. Anybody else want to come in? If there's time, I'd like to respond to your comment about the Mahabharata, but I, I can wait. I can't see anyone else. Can you? Anyone? Can you? Suzanne, can you spot anybody else? Balbinda, please. Oh, okay. So um, thanks for that. Uh, I'm aware that. Um, uh, the Mahabharata has those kinds of notions that the Sikh tradition have, but the key differences are quite plentiful, uh, especially in terms of the new Sangat, the new community that the Sikhs uh, 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 develop, which is not competitive. You, here you have competing authorities in the Mahabharata, and that's where all the tension comes from, and uh, who to believe and who to follow, which which ones, which vows take priority over, over others, whereas what uh, 
the Sikh tradition is talking about is not a universalism of compete, a competing levels of authority, but a pluriversal. Um, this is another decolonial concept that uh, Minolo talks about. And this is, uh, the, the pluriversal comes from the bottom up, it's not top down, whether it's a Christian narrative or an Islamic narrative of how the world should be ordered, but a pluriversal comes from the bottom up. And this is very in line with what Susan and Philip was just mentioning in terms of a ground up about the history of yoga all of us contributing. And that re that requires a new comparativity. All comparative frames before have been led, led by a monolithical culture. The Sikh tradition acknowledged that uh, groups have to come together, and that's why the Sikh scripture itself has the voices of the other inside it. So when Finian was talking about deep listening, I forgot to mention that Sahaj Yoga, the fir very first thing in the Japji talks about is listening. That's how you do yoga, is you listen, not to deep listening. It's not to tradition, it's not to the body, it's not to the self, it's not to the absolute, as you were mentioning. It's to the other. And the other is all of those. So there's two things in operation, oneself and others. Sure. But the other is also the voice of dis disenfranchised voices, the dispossessed voices, and to hear that. So the Sikh movement was getting um, a union with those, mobilizing those voices. Mm -hmm. So just a human... Yoga is humanism. It's, a, it's a, um, something you don't need a technique for. So the commodification of yoga, decolonizing yoga from the speak, Sikh perspective is to decapitalize it, decolonize it, decommodify it, and return to the thing that is already there. Yeah. Good. Well, I think we'll, we can end with the pluralistic conclusion that every tradition does have something to say that it um, considers uh, to be unique to it. And it's those different forms of uniqueness that we need to be informed by uh, mutually rather than make exclusivist claims paradoxically about our inclusivism. So I think this, this volume um, shows the coexistence of uh, these perspectives and the way in which uh, they might interact and give us a whole that is larger than the sum of its parts. So thank you all very much. And that, that was wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, the launch of this book is the start of uh, a conversation. Uh, and and uh, my apologies to those uh, who have not been able to uh, have more questions uh, on this forum, but I'm sure that we'll have many years in the future engaging with this book.